Hybrid warfare is a doctrine, a military doctrine that emerged in the wake of serial military defeats for the U.S. military in Iraq and Afghanistan, and also the 2006 defeat of the Israeli Defense Forces by Hezbollah. Hybrid warfare has developed uh, after these defeats, and military planners have been thinking about how to win and wage war in conditions in which both the populations, the communities that are fighting the war, are unwilling to take casualties, unwilling to support uh, aggressive war, and the populations that are on the receiving end of war have figured out ways uh, to, to resist the war through, through popular warfare. Um, so hybrid warfare takes several different forms. One form is what people call lawfare, uh, which is a kind of, you know, we could think of it as a constitutional coup. It often takes place in the courts uh, among judges. And the most extreme, perhaps, example of this is what happened with uh, the imprisonment of Lula before the last Brazilian election. Another major form that hybrid warfare takes is sanctions. And I think we can understand sanctions in terms of military history and a long history of siege warfare. And what sanctions do, what sieges do, is hold a whole community of people uh, under attack, not just combatants, not just military combatants, but especially and crucially, sieges hold civilians under attack, preventing them from having access to food, preventing them from having access to medicine. And attacking forces and sieges rely on the besieged people uh, uh, running out of food, running out of medicine, and having their unity broken, so they capitulate. And those who are under siege have to find out ways to, to uh, live with the shortages of food and medicine and have to maintain their unity and outweigh their attackers in order to win the siege. So siege warfare in the contemporary arena takes place through weaponry like, uh, you know, no-fly zones, tomahawk missiles, drone strikes, but it also takes place through new forms of weaponry, weaponry digital, immaterial weaponry. Uh, so, you know, we have digital attacks on infrastructure like water and electricity, but also most crucially in the form of sanctions, we have attacks through uh, international trade, through international currency that prevent a country that isolated totally from the, the rest of the world, prevent a country from uh, participating in trade, from getting basic supplies like medicine, um, very basic supplies like food, and really attacks, uh, again, not, not, not necessarily even the state, not the wealthy, not any political power, um, but the people overall, the power of the political people and their unity. Why people in the United States and North America should care about sanctions, about siege warfare, is because these are the conditions that affect working class life and, and the life of the poor and the dispossessed in North America as well. If we take, for example, the example of uh, food, so the United States has placed the CLAP program under sanctions. The CLAP program in Venezuela provides subsidized food to over six million households, cooking staples like rice and beans and cooking oil, um, regular shipments of highly subsidized food, uh, over six million households in Venezuela. And this program has been placed under sanctions ostensibly for corruption. But the Treasury Secretary uh, said that you know, this, this, the program is being placed under sanctions, as he said, because the Maduro government uses food as a form of social control. Now, at the same time, the same administration in the United States has created a series of new policy changes in the SNAP program, which is formerly known as food stamps, removed hundreds of thousands, millions of people um, from the SNAP program and removed their access to, to food. Um, and so one of the things that uh, we learned today in today's conversation is that over 30 percent of humanity is living under the yoke of sanctions across the world today. And within the United States, 28.7 percent of households with children headed by single women, 28.7 percent, were food insecure in the last year. So if we look at something as specific as food and hunger, we can see a unity of interest among working class and poor people here in North America and in Venezuela and in other countries that are being subjected to these brutal sanctions.